Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a great day, a great morning. We're going to ask folks to come on in and have a seat. And we're going to get started kicking off the inaugural Black Developers Conference here in the city of Cincinnati. Um, at the very top, I do want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues who are in the room. I uh, want to give a shout out to Councilmember Liz Keating, who has joined us this morning. Uh, Councilmember Scotty Johnson is with us this morning. And um, you will hear from our esteemed Vice Mayor, Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney, uh, a little later this morning. Uh, so this work is a collaboration between the city of Cincinnati, uh, the Port Authority, a Cincinnati Development Fund, and the Greater Cincinnati Realtors Association. But um, what I really want to highlight is that all of these organizations um, really co-signed on my shenanigans. Uh, I said, hey, I want to do a Black Developers Conference. Uh, my uh, buddy Dariq and uh, Felicia at the Greater Cincinnati Realtors Association, they said, you know, we want to do the same thing. So our minds were alight. And I called my friends at the port, uh, Jilson and Rahel, and they said, all right, but only if you do this right uh, will we get on board. And then our friends at CDF said, count us in. And we spent a year. Uh, planning this. And um, there are a number of people that I, I want to thank. Um, well, they're on the planning commission. Uh, Marcus Parrish, uh, thank you so much. You sat down with us week after week and helped plan this out. Felicia Bell, uh, Alexandria Porter, who is here, thank you. Uh, Robbie Suggs, a special shout out to Robbie Suggs because Robbie gets a phone call or a text from me weekly asking her about something. And she says, Reggie, if you don't leave me alone. Um, but Robbie, I'm sorry, I won't leave you alone. You have too much, you have too much knowledge. Uh, Sarah Sheets from Cincinnati Development Fund, just these are people who spent their time um, planning with us. Uh, and I said, Rahel Michaels and Josen Daniels from the port. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to talk about our sponsors tonight because what I feel such a deep gratitude is that our sponsors not only uh, gave their dollars, but they gave their time and their expertise. And so I want to shout out Fifth Third and Susan Thomas again. I just, you know, the th I think the theme to know is if I learn that you have knowledge that I want, I will call you and email you. So Susan also gets lots of calls from me. Um, FC Cincinnati, they hosted our. Um, um, Fireside Chat last night, and they have been a great partner. A Guardian Savings Bank, Union Savings Bank, PNC, a US Bank. So we have lots of financial institutions that dug in and said, yes, this is important to be here. Uh, the Community Builders, Local Laborers 265, KMK Law, Urban Sites, uh, Messer Construction, uh, 3CDC, at the Model Group. Uh, and Greater Cincinnati Foundation. And so all of these folks, again, gave their dollars, but also gave their time and their expertise. You'll hear from me later this afternoon, but uh, our uh, a great mayor is uh, representing the city of Cincinnati at the uh, uh, US Conference of Mayors, and you have to, uh, the mayor has to represent you, so you can't send a proxy, but he did uh, film a welcome video for us this evening, so we are going to, uh, Enjoy welcoming them for our mayor, Mayor Aftab Pirival. Welcome to the Black Developers Conference. My name is Aftab Pirival, and I have the privilege of being the mayor of the city of Cincinnati. This is our opportunity, this conference, to ensure that racial equity is at every step of the development process, whether that is the retail space, whether that's the development, whether that's the contracting, subcontracting, and the capital stack. It is our goal to ensure that when we continue to grow as a city, we grow equitably. And in order to achieve that, we have to be intentional about creating more opportunities for black developers and black owners to celebrate and share in the successes that we're seeing here in Cincinnati. Since getting elected, this council and I have been laser focused on reducing the wealth gap, on reducing the wage gap, on investing specifically in communities and people who for a very long time have been disinvested. This is our opportunity together as a community to learn from the best and the brightest minds who are coming here to teach us 
and to give us opportunities to put the city in a place of growth, but most importantly, equitable growth so that, so that all 52 neighborhoods are sharing in that success. I wanna thank Council Member Harris for putting this together, for taking the lead on council and in City Hall to continue to focus on making sure that everyone has access to the table and everyone gets a piece of the pie. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much for investing in the city. I'm so sorry I couldn't personally be there, but I'm so excited to see what comes out of this conference and that we continue to build a better Cincinnati together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pirabal. Um, I, you know, I always appreciate our mayor um, and his support and our words, but I, I, I also have to say that um, this is a group effort. And so um, to officially welcome you to the city, I'd like to bring up Vice Mayor Jen Michelle Lemon Kearney, who has also been um, a champion of equity work on this council and uh, an incredible colleague, Vice Mayor. Good morning, everybody. We are so excited about this conference. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Council Member Harris mentioned it, but this has been a year in the making. And Council Member Harris has worked so hard on this. I mean, the excitement has just been growing and growing and growing. And the idea that to bring equity, we've got to work for it. We can't just say, you know, we want, we want opportunities for everybody. We have to work for it. And this is a big part of that work. So can we start by giving Reggie Harris a big round of applause? And I love the fact that he worked with Derek Dansby of the Realtist. Simone Charles is here running around. You're going to see her doing so much work. I know they're going to call out all the members of the team. It took, it took a group effort, but I'm telling you, Reggie, as the leader, made this happen. And so we are, we are really thankful. So Mayor Pureval would love to be here, as he said in the video. And he's really told you our vision about opening up opportunities for everybody. You know that d development, construction, um, you know, real estate, these are the ways historically that people have made big wealth, the big wealth in this country. And a lot of people, a lot of us, a lot of black and brown people have been left out of that opportunity. And so we are here to change that. This entire council, all of my council members have been fighting hard to close that wealth gap and you are are a big part of that and so we want you to soak up the information this morning but part of the real beauty of this conference is that we've got people here who are developers who are want to be developers who are you know new developers experienced developers we've got bankers and lenders here we have you know, realtors people from the community who are just interested in how does all this work we want you to all connect because a big part of this is meeting people from all over in different facets of this v field so that you can really grow and prosper and take advantage of, of all of these opportunities i talked to someone this morning who took a 5 a.m. flight to be here and looks really wide awake and I'm, I'm surprised but there is coffee out there but um, this is going to be a power a powerful powerful day so again I want to thank Councilmember Harris my my council members who are here now um, Scotty Johnson and Liz Keating everybody's going to be here um, I see Tanya Banks is here from uh, Mika Owen's office, and I know so many others will be here because we don't want to miss this opportunity to see you and meet you. So thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Get ready to build some wealth, build more wealth. This is a power-packed room, so take advantage of it. Thank you. All right, we're going to keep it keep it pushing because we're running a few minutes behind. But I do want to shout out uh, Councilmember Mika Owens has joined us uh, this morning. She's back there. Thank you, Councilmember. And we also have uh, Forest Park Mayor Aaron Brown who is with us as well. And I know Aaron, I saw him around here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to bring up our next speaker, uh, Joe Huber uh, from Cincinnati Development Fund uh, with a word of special message, and then we're gonna flow right into Derek Dansby and start our new session. So you will see me later this afternoon. I'll be floating around. Thank you so much. Uh, let's learn and network.
Thank you, Council Member, Member Harris, for uh, giving me the second, too. Welcome, everyone. It's exciting to see this room. I'm uh, Joe Huber, President and CEO of the Cincinnati Development Fund. We are a nonprofit, non regulated lender. We are mission based. Um, we get involved in a lot of public private partnerships with many groups in this room, and you'll hear all about that. I have the opportunity to um, host a, an esteemed panel in a few minutes um, talking about how to approach lenders and investors. Um, but CDF is committed to providing access to capital, and that capital is not just financial. Um, it is also about connecting people and building relationships, and it's also about building technical assistance. So our, our team of lenders, our board, our whole staff is committed to being in, uh, in the loan process with you for the long haul. We know uh, the path to development is not a straight one, and so uh, we have a great team. Sarah Sheets is here, Kevin Labuama is here, um, Morgan Smith is here. She's our newest employee who just started uh, this week. And again, we are just so excited to be here uh, with you this morning. And I know you have a, a great day ahead of you. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is, this is a great day. This is something that has never, ever been done in the city of Cincinnati, a black developers conference focused on increasing number of African-American developers we have in this city. So give yourselves a round of applause for being here this morning. I don't want to take up too much time and repeat anything that's already been said. My name is Derek Dansby. I am the proud president of the Greater Cincinnati Realtors Association. We are the eighth largest Realtors chapter in the country. So we're really excited about that. We have a fabulous team of Realtors that are here in the room today. If they could just stand and be recognized, all the Realtors. And if you are a real estate professional and if you are encouraged and want to see an increase in black home ownership and, and want to see democracy in housing, please see those folks that stood up and they'll have a table right outside that you can stop by and learn some more information about how you can get engaged. Um, I want to go ahead and just keep this brief. Um, I want to again thank all the sponsors, the planning committee, um, all the moderators and speakers who have come today to um, not only give you um, their knowledge and their resources, but more than anything, their time, right? We could all be at our office, we could all be at our work site, we could all be someplace showing a house if you're me, um, but you're here today and you're here with us and we really appreciate that commitment. Uh, most of all, I wanna thank um, um, Simone Charles, is she here? There, she's in the back. Simone is a star, y'all. Give her a huge round of applause. When we started this process, you know, Reggie was going out um, raising all the funds to make sure that this was a first class event. And when I walked in here today, I don't know if you all were as floored as I was, but I saw this space and it is absolutely amazing. We're not in a, a little rec center somewhere. We're not in the community room on the third floor of City Hall. We are here in Duke Energy Center talking about increasing black developers. This is a very historic day for this city. Very historic day. So we have all the key contacts in the room. We've got all the resources. We've got lenders. We've got community development professionals. Um, we're all here to share our knowledge, our best practices on how you can succeed as a black developer. Regardless if you um, are just thinking about getting into development, um, if you're a micro developer like myself, you've done a few flips here and there, you're looking to do more, or if you're an experienced developer, we have something here for you today. So please um, take the opportunity um, to network and to do some business together. You know, one of the things we kicked off last night that I wanna see when we do this again next year, I'm manifesting it when we do it again next year. I want to find some people who, as a result of this conference yesterday and today, were able to forge a partnership, were able to do a new project, we're able to build something that you can come back and talk about here next year and how you can inspire others to do the same. So I want to make sure that that's something that we make a priority. 
more than anything, let's do some business together and let's build something. There's a lot of areas that we need help and need assistance. We need more inventory in the city. We don't have enough. And you as black developers are gonna be here to help us solve that problem. So before I um, um, has asked Jocelyn and, and folks from the port to come up, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you haven't had a chance, please download the app on your uh, name badge, there's a QR code, you can download the app. If you have really good eyes, really, really, really good eyes, on the back of your badge is the day all laid out. But if you go to the app, you can see all of the, you can see all of the different workshop titles that we have in the description in that. Um, there'll be a workshop in this main room, but then there'll also be two other workshops um, as we go along the day. If you go back to the registration table, you can gain entry into those two rooms as well. So if you check out the app, it'll tell you exactly where it's supposed to be. And then outside of each room, there's a sign with the uh, name of the actual workshop that's going on. Um, black coffee, have you guys enjoyed black coffee? Yeah. All right, they will be here today until 1230. So if any time throughout the day you wanna step out, you wanna grab a coffee, they'll be there till 1230. Our soundtrack today is being provided by DJ Wes. So when we are on break, You'll hear the music, it's gonna help keep the energy up, help keep the vibe going, but when the music stops, you should be in a room. <laughs> so you know if you're in the right, if you don't hear music, then you should be in one of these three rooms. Um, and uh, we've got plenty of places for you to take photos as you take photos and you post them online, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, um, threads, uh, TikTok, whatever, you please use the hashtag Build Black Sensi and Black BLK Sensi. So build BLK Sensi as you take your photos and share them online. We just want to make sure that the whole world knows about what we're doing. But with no further ado, um, if you're getting started in real estate, one of the big things that you have to do is you need to acquire land. You need to acquire a building. Um, one of our uh, biggest partners in that land, in, in getting land, is our Port Authority of Cincinnati. And they are here today to talk to you how you can acquire land from the city. So I'd like to ask Mr. Jilson Daniels and his team to come on up and get started. Thank you all. Good morning. I'm Jilson Daniels. I'm Vice President of Economic Equity with the Port. And uh, welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, we're going to focus today on high-level information about how to do business with the Port. The port embraces unique tools to fuel equitable development that results in both enhanced employment opportunities and increased housing within our neighborhoods and, and accessibility within our industrial zones. With these tools in mind, we often find that many in our community have questions about how and what we do and a lot of questions of why we do it that way. That's what we want to address today in this panel discussion with three of our all-stars and subject matter experts at the port. Philip Denning, Executive Vice President of our Neighborhood Strategy, Bill Fisher, Vice President of Community Development, and Melissa Johnson, Senior Vice President of our Industrial Strategy. Anchored by our dedicated team of 35, we are steadfast in our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which we believe formed the bedrock of sustainable progress through real estate development. Again, I'm Jilson Daniels and the moderator for this panel. Before we begin, I will ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves in one minute or less and tell us what they do. First, Philip Denning. Good morning. Thanks, everybody. Philip Denning at the port. Uh, I run our neighborhood work inside of the port, and I kind of dabble in some other stuff, industrial and, um, and finance as, as I'm needed. Um, but the, the neighborhood work of the port touches uh, commercial corridors, commercial businesses, um, business districts, lots of community work with community improvement corporations and CDCs, uh, and of course, uh, residential housing focused on home ownership uh, and how that touches uh, building black wealth. Uh, thanks very much for, for having us. Thank you, Philip. Next, Melissa Johnson. Good morning. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces, those I can see from um, the light, but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, again, I'm Melissa Johnson, Senior Vice President of Industrial Development. I've been um, with the Port Authority for 11 years, and the entire time I've been focused on industrial real estate and um, also helping facilitate 
large scale site growth uh, to attract opportunity. Um, we do that with a, a really great and creative team and appreciate being here this morning and talking more about that. Thank you, Melissa. And finally, and last but not least, Mr. Bill Fisher. Good morning, and yeah, those really bright lights. Um, so uh, Bill Fisher, Vice President of Community Development with the Port Authority. I've been with the Port for almost five years. Prior to that, I don't wanna say how long, 20 something plus years at the city of Cincinnati, most of that time in community and economic development. I oversee a, a small but very dedicated, powerful team that uh, uh, does our commercial and our residential work. And uh, we'll talk more about it, but residential, we do a lot of uh, actual construction. So we build single family, renovate single family homes. And then the commercial work where we're working in business corridors, most of that is with a partner, with a developer. All right. So none of these faces uh, up here uh, should be new to you. Philip and, and Bill, um, before they joined the port, were with the city of Cincinnati. And Melissa, she's just been with the port forever, I think her entire life. Um, so um, I'm going to start with Philip. Um, as executive vice president of our neighborhood strategy, tell us your overall development of vision and, and the strategy. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, first, I'm going to completely hijack your question, Jilson. Um, if you could, if you have ever worked with the port, the land bank, or the HERC in any way, shape, or form, can you raise your hand just so we can? Okay, all right, actually that's great because it's not as many people as I would think. Um, and so that's fantastic, there's a lot of new faces. Um, the port is weird, we're not a port, there's no boats. Um, but we do manage the county's land bank, the Hamilton County Land Bank, and that's a principally way in which um, the, the land bank and the port um, have property that we are trying to bring back to highest and best use. And so really our industrial, or sorry, our neighborhood strategy um, is, is pretty simple. It's about building um, better places. And we all know in this room and elsewhere that good places have access to good jobs. Um, they have vibrant business districts and commercial corridors where neighbors and residents can access services and start businesses. And they have housing, safe, stable housing that is, um, that is a foundation for building families' wealth. Uh, and really, those are the three main things that the port is, is doing. Um, so inside of the neighborhood strategy, it's all about making sure that the commercial corridors and neighborhood business districts and housing are working together to, um, to get better. Um, what that means a lot of the time is that we're working in neighborhoods and places that have been on the down and out and have been disinvested for many, many years, decades. Um, and so a lot of the property that the port has, the land bank has about a thousand properties um, that are currently sitting in inventory. And the vast majority of those are not, you know, the, um, the easy door to building wealth and creating development, right? They're in tough neighborhoods, they're in tough real estate markets. Um, they are not ready to make money for anybody. Um, and there's a whole lot of challenges that come along with those parcels. Um, and so one of the things that the port really has done inside the neighborhood strategy is, yes, make those parcels available, but also um, be patient, low, uh, have low access barriers so that we can work with small and minority developers as they begin to build their development business, as they understand how to work with the city of Cincinnati through the economic incentives process and through the entitlements process. So, um, so yeah, that's a, our neighborhood development strategy, and I'm sure Bill will talk a little bit more on that. Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> um, I forgot uh, some house, one housekeeping thing to share with everyone. Uh, we are uh, accepting questions, um, and I believe the format is we have volunteers who are going to roam through the room and hand you a card where you can write your question. So uh, we want you to learn more about what the port does, and we don't necessarily want to limit this conversation at this panel discussion based on the content that I've come up with for uh, our three panelists to speak to. So if you have a question, please uh, grab one of those cards and write your question on. They'll bring it up here, and I promise you I will read it unless I don't like the question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so Bill, I'm, I'm going to uh, switch to you now. Um, how do developers specifically, this is a developers conference, how do they work with the port in order to acquire property? Well, and Jilson, I, I know we're 
time's not real long, so it, in addition to questions for us, there's also a table out there. I don't know if you mentioned that. So yep. if you don't get a question answered, don't have time to ask, um, please stop at our table, and, and there'll be people there that can help. But um, really, if you're interested in, in looking at property from the Port Authority, there's really two ways that you can access property. We have, we have a website, so the Hamilton County Land Bank org. The properties there are posted, and, and as Philip said, there's a lot of properties on there. I'm going to say 80 to 90 percent of those are single-family lots. The way the, the land bank get, gets property is it has to go through, it's, it's tax delinquent, usually blighted, vacant, before it comes to us. So as Philip mentioned, it is a challenge, it's usually challenged property, but you can take a look at it, look at the location online, there's an application process, and you know our mission is to put that land back to productive use for the, the county and the city. So we're gonna ask some hard questions. We're gonna make sure that whoever's buying this property from us has the ability, has the, um, the capability, financial capability, to put that back to productive use. So, um, but we're there to help you. So we have an application process. We're there to kind of help through that process. But ultimately, we're gonna, it's our mission to get that, job, that property back to work. So, um, so one way is our website. Another way, and more of our, our commercial property, we'll get property, use, oftentimes in business districts where the uh, city of Cincinnati or other entities have funded us for a specific purpose. Like this business district has some issues. They've, they've funded us to, to acquire property and we're not just gonna put it on the website, we're actually gonna go out for an RFP. And we have a, have a uh, RFP which stands for Request for Proposals, excuse me, for Request for Proposals. And we're gonna be looking for probably a specific use. So in, in our business district, we may want a mixed use. So retail on the first floor, residential above, kind of a lot of density to bring some life back to a business district. Uh, those are really hard projects. So we're gonna be looking for a developer that, that wants to tackle that kind of project. So those are the two, really the two ways you can access property through the Port Authority, both if you're just starting out maybe look at a single family home that's in our inventory. We don't have a lot of those, but we have a lot of land, single family land. But if you're more experienced, ready for a really challenging project, um, either watch our social media where we announce our RFPs, or if you wanna send an email through that same website, hamlincountylandbank.org, we'll add you to our list, just specifically ask to be added to the RFP list, and you'll get an email when we're issuing RFP. We've done three this year, I don't think we have any more planned for this year and sort of next year sort of up in the air, but we did just recently award um, three RFPs through that process. Thanks, Bill. So as a follow-up question, you said that we have challenged property. What does that mean? So the, the property that comes to the port, and, and as Philip said, these are, these are properties that nobody else has, has acquired, nobody else. They probably have gone through an auction um, for tax foreclosure. Nobody has bought them yet. So these are properties that have been vacant for a long time. They're in, they're in just a tough market, and so it's, fun, it's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work. So oftentimes people that buy our properties, our single family homes, are gonna do a lot of sweat equity, so they can, they can afford to purchase the property, but they, they're gonna work it themselves. They're just, it's, it's not the kind of desirable property that you're gonna to go to a bank and they're just automatically gonna give you a, a full loan on, um, on the construction costs. Right, thank you. Melissa, so your turn. Um, you're in charge of our industrial strategy. Tell us what that means. Happy to, um, but quickly I, I wanna tie a couple of points together and that you know, when we talk about the port's work and we talk about it in commercial development or in neighborhood or industrial, that there really is an organizational strategy hovering above that. And in the industrial strategy, we're focused on trying to create jobs and create um, inventory in real estate that can attract new investment that will continue to stabilize you know, you know, growth in commercial districts and also in home ownership. And there's, you know, there's a lot of synergy between the work that we all do um, here. So I just think that's important to note. But in the industrial strategy, um, this kind of kicked off with the port in 2016. So it's been around for a little while. And the port board um, was trying to be responsive to a lack of demand in large scale real estate parcels effectively. That based on data, we were seeing that the city and the region was being potentially overlooked for investment by companies to come here 
here, um, create manufacturing investment, have job creation, and you know, um, family supporting wages, and that there needed to be a call to action around that and create some inventory. So similarly in the industrial strategy, we take on very challenged property, um, but our, our focus typically is 10 acres, 20, 30, 40, 50 acre parcels that had had some prior um, use, uh, likely industry that is, has gone kind of defunct or has moved on. And we take that and have also very patient um, kind of work to be done to reprioritize that and bring that back into the um, market at market rate to attract that investment and have that job creation and keep the cycle going in our community. This strategy, while it's been focused on large-scale sites for a while, has also evolved into more corridor approaches. And these are approaches that have a concentration where we think that there's a lot of infrastructure to be leveraged. There's a lot of workforce to be leveraged and um, you know, a multitude of resources that still sit around corridors that maybe have smaller parcels, but when you can create an assemblage or create some density that you can also create economic development and you know, generate some you know, economic catalyst there to benefit um, the economy here you know, as well. So. Can, I, can I build on that, Jillson? No. Yes. Because um, we keep talking about challenge property, I think it's important. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things you'll read in the newspaper, of course, uh, now and then is, is uh, you know, the port was awarded a grant for this, the port got ODOD funds for this. Um, one of the things that our staff who aren't uh, weren't asked, forced um, to be up here today, um, is really good at doing is surveying the landscape of state, federal, and local funding to go find grants and other sources of funds to address those challenges inside of um, industrial property or inside neighborhoods. Um, and so that's one of the things we're doing right now is working through almost $30 million of funding that was uh, granted to the port uh, to do brownfield remediation and some of these industrial sites that have been vacant uh, because all of you, the private market, isn't capable or interested in, in, in redeveloping brownfields, right? Someone has to lose $7 million for that industrial site before it's uh, really available for, for um, a developer to you know, work the magic. And the same thing is true that Bill said on some of these single family sites. Um, and one example is uh, we, we received about a million and a half dollars last year because almost 150 of the sites that are in the land bank, um, we found out had actually buried demolition rubble under the grass that we didn't know and no one knew about. Um, so we were able to find funding to go dig all that rubble out, put fresh good fill in, um, and put the grass back so that, um, so that when we uh, hopefully build up those residential markets enough to attract development capital and interested developers, it's one less barrier um, that the, the developer has to have in their capital stack. So I think it's just helpful to put some um, detail what, what that means challenged and, and some of the other work that goes into preparing sites for development. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Um, I have a follow-up question for Melissa, but before I, I ask, um, I've noticed something. I don't have any questions yet. And so I'm going to keep it real. We get a lot of questions. People question us and what we do. And that's why we're having this session today. And, and everyone wants to know why we do what we do. And so I encourage you, this is your time now, to ask what's been on your mind about working with the port, about acquiring property. So write something down. Um, Derek or any volunteers, I think some people are suggesting to me that they have something in writing. Um, so before I read this question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Melissa the follow-up question. Melissa, you used the same word that Bill used and you said that we have a lot of challenged industrial sites. Give us some examples of those industrial sites and why they're challenged. Yeah, where do I start? Um, so, you know, I, I made a reference to our focus in the industrial strategy to be around, around large parcels and a lot of the prior use there has been in prior industry. And a lot of what we see in trying to accelerate the large scale real estate inventory is that they're often laden with significant risk. And this risk shows up in environmental contamination, um, demolition. Uh, we do have some properties that have just been kind of demolition by neglect. They're unsafe. Uh, they attract 
um, urban explorers and interests that you know really kind of creates an unsafe environment for um, our, our neighborhoods and for you know our community at large. So we often find um, that some sites are just entirely limited by the inability to access them. That there is a real need for very expensive infrastructure to unlock those properties and create you know opportunity. So you know we had a, a couple examples. I mean the port did acquire. Um, the former Cincinnati Gardens um, a number of years ago. And, you know, the, the gardens, I think, was a, a great part of our history and served as, a, you know, a source of entertainment for a variety of venues. But, you know, it, I think as we look across the real estate landscape, it, it probably had come to a time where that could have been more productive for um, the Bond Hill community and Roselawn. So the port acquired it, and we did um, get funds to tear it down and, and ultimately create three parcels for development, and two of those you've seen. Um, all three of them did sell, but two of them have had, you know, vertical, you know, partners. Uh, Emerge Manufacturing, which I think is uh, on a panel later today, you know, invest there in the community, create jobs in the manufacturing industry, and give back to that neighborhood. So I think, you know, that was an example of some defunct real estate. There are other properties we own throughout the county, a former Dow chemical plant, which is significantly environmentally contaminated. And Philip re referenced being patient. There's a lot of patience when you have to unwind some of these, especially with federal and state regulatory partners, to navigate this. And there's times that when the poor can sit in the middle, if you will, that we can sit in a really uncomfortable place in real estate, and those regulator regulatory partners trust us or trust our history and our expertise somewhat, and we can kind of ease that burden as the property will transfer into, you know, with a development partner or for an end user. So um, it's it's... It's fun and it's complicated, but you know we we think it's good work and um, yeah, it's it's complex. Terrific, thank you. And Melissa mentioned Emerge Manufacturing as being one of our success stories. Uh, uh, Christina Booth uh, it was a business owner. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with her, but she stepped into the development world and um, built her own manufacturing facility at at the old uh, Cincinnati Garden site which we probably call it something else now, right? Emerge Manufacturing. Um, well, Emerge Manufacturing, I'm sorry. What did I say? <laughs> okay. All right, I have a question. I have a question. Um, of the 1,000, uh, actually this is for Bill or Philip. Of the 1,000 parcels, which 80 to 90% 90, 90 are single family, are they concentrated in any certain communities or neighborhoods? And if so, is there a strategy to address it? It's a great question, and you know, Bill, you can follow up if I don't answer correctly. Um, I, not not concentrated, not super concentrated. I would say maybe eight years ago we had a lot more properties in Evanston, and we embarked on a residential development strategy there to um, stabilize the Evanston residential market. Um, that was successful, and what that has meant is that you know the the private development market can has really stepped in. So. The port's role in in residential development inside the inside Evanston has really diminished, um, and that's a great example of kind of what we're here to do, which is work ourselves out of a job um, in neighborhoods. Um, so right now, a lot of our residential inventory is um, in the Fairmounts, is in uh, the Price Hills, um, and then we increasingly have uh, uh, some other scattered site properties across the count, further across the county, and. Lincoln Heights, where Deborah's building new construction homes, um, where we're finding um, collaborations with our jurisdictional partners, where the city or a city of Lincoln Heights or the city of Cincinnati or a neighborhood says, hey, we'd really like you to be here working with us. Here's a collection of properties, um, maybe that's in receivership. Um, can the port acquire those properties uh, and, and clean them up and make them available for, for development? So I don't know if you wanna talk. Yeah, I'll just add real quickly. So the land bank was created um, actually as a result of the foreclosure crisis. And so uh, a lot of the neighborhoods, I remember being at the city looking at a map um, with, with uh, Sister Barb with working in neighborhoods at all the foreclosures and they were, they were heavily concentrated in Evanston, the Price Hills. So that's a result, that's what you're seeing in the land bank now. Those properties have gone into foreclosure. They, they went into tax foreclosure, they ended up in the land bank. So. You, there is a really, we just launched a new um, website that actually starts off with a map. So if you go to our properties on the Land Bank website, you'll see an interactive map and you can actually zoom in. But it starts with a, a view of the whole county and you can kind of tell where they're concentrated. 
Uh, Bill, what's the best way to apply to purchase property from the land bank? Well, through the land bank is actually go to that website, look at what, you know, decide what you're doing, what is it that you're looking for, and then you can actually filter. So you can, if you're working for commercial property, there's a filter you can put on that. I just want to see commercial buildings. I just want to see commercial property, which again, we don't have a lot of, but um, if, you, if you're looking for a single family home site to build on, you put that filter on and it'll show you on this map, and then you can sort of go into different um, areas of the city, find that lot, or lots, and then there's an application process. That's also, the applications are on the website. So we're gonna ask you those kind of questions. So what's your plan? Have you ever done this before? How are you, How is your financing? And again, we're also there to help. So if you come to us and say, well, I don't know, I've never financed this before. Well, we have really good friends at the Cincinnati Development Fund who are, that's, the, that's what they're there to do is help finance those projects. So we may lead you to a, a partner of ours. Thank you. Philip, I have an executive question for you. The Homestead Program by Price Hill Will is something that we, City Council, want to replicate throughout the city. What is the process for community development corporations, CDCs, to acquire property from the port and feed them into the Homestead Program pipeline? Yeah, great question. And, and the, uh, the the homesteading program that Price Hill Will runs is an incredible success story. Um, so I'm, I might get it wrong. So if Price Hill Will's here, tell me. Uh, but Price Hill Will has, as a neighborhood CDC, has gone out and acquired properties on their own, not from the port, but from the private market, um, and then connected uh, those properties with um, families who really are, don't have a history of, of um, being, having participated with a bank and maybe can't go through the traditional financing route, but do have the skills um, in their family or, or networks to renovate and own a property. So Price Hill Will goes and gets a private property, um, connects them to a, a worthy family who has the skills to renovate them, um, and, then, uh, and then they have essentially a 100% success rate in, um, in families paying off all of their loans within, I think, five years. So we've actually worked with Price Hill Will, um, the, the port acquired 200 investor, institutional investor-owned homes two years ago with the goal of ch uh, uh, changing them from uh, rental to homeowner and hopefully giving those renters the opportunity to become homeowners in the home that they were renting from the, um, these giant Wall Street um, uh, institutional investors that have kind of been gobbling up houses in, in Hamilton County. So we've been working with Price Hill Will to, uh, to, uh, as a partner and have already sold them a couple of homes out of that care portfolio. Um, one of the changes that's happened in real estate, really since COVID, um, real estate went bananas, um, is that the port, the land bank, is actually ending up with fewer and fewer structures. Most of those structures that are going through the, the tax foreclosure process, they're being purchased. They're being purchased by investors. And the land bank gets property when no one purchases it at sheriff sale. Um, so that's one of the reasons why most of the property that we have today is vacant, vacant land, um, not a structure. Uh, but that is a very worthy, uh, the Price Hill Will Homesteading is an absolute model for the country. Uh, and we continue to work with them and love to do it more. Thank you, Philip. Uh, this is another question for you and perhaps Bill. Um, how do you balance redemption without displacement of long-term low-income homeowners? That's a great question. Um, it's tough because the, the, the people that you really want to benefit from new investment and um, new development are the homeowners who've been there um, for the longest time. Uh, and I think there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, uh, one, uh, the port did uh, create a new homeowner repair program inside of the land bank two years ago. And uh, what we're doing with those funds is focusing on neighborhoods that are rapidly accelerating to make sure that we can um, uh, make grants, not loans, there are very few homeowner grants that are available, make homeowner grants available to um, homeowners that have code violations or might have code violations. Um, because that's one of the biggest issues with longtime homeowners is if they're not able to um, take care of their property, um, a lot of bad things can happen after that. So we want longtime homeowners to be able to stay there and get a bunch of, of that um, earned equity that they got. So we have a homeowner repair program um, that last year was in Evanston, this year is in um, Springfield, it's, it's outside of the city, Springfield Township in Coleraine, um, but it'll probably be back in the city next year. Um, 
And uh, ultimately, uh, the other uh, most important way is focusing on new units, new construction. I mean, most of our vision and our neighborhood work is focused on creating net new neighbors um, inside of Cincinnati neighborhoods. Um, and uh, another way uh, is our care portfolio focusing on creating more homeowners. Because when you're a homeowner and you have access to homeownership, uh, you're not really at the helm of having to pay increased rents. You're, you're, a 30-year mortgage is fixed. That's one of the best ways to make sure that, um, that our neighbors um, can stay where they are and, and earn the wealth that appreciates from a neighborhood that improves. Believe it or not, Philip told me before the panel that he didn't have much to say. Wait, Bill had something. Hey, Jilson, just to put another plug in for our partners. So, you know, the home ownership rate in the city of Cincinnati is, is extremely low. And so our work really does benefit those homeowners, but there's a lot of renters and they're the most vulnerable. So I think two of our partners, one that, uh, I mentioned earlier, working in neighborhoods, the Home Ownership Center, are training organizations for, for people that want to become homeowners. And a lot of, there's a lot of people that just don't know how, don't know where to start. Um, they just feel like they're never going to own a home. You know, we need to push more people into those programs because this whole conference is about building wealth, probably the first place people should do it is start at home in their owning their own home. All right, I've been given the signal that we're running out of time, so I have one more question and then I'm gonna ask you all the same question. Um, sorry, I have to put these on to read this. Um, what are the key points that the port looks at to award a property on commercial and single family sites and who is your ideal buyer? So the, the thing I, I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure you have the capacity. Though um, sometimes we ask these really hard questions, and people feel like they're just you just not you just don't want me to get this property. No, what we don't want is you to get the property and fail. And so the ideal buyer is somebody who's really listening, who wants to who wants to really uh, listen and understand the uh, information we give them. So we get a lot of people that say they put an application in and we're like, well, we've, you've never done this before. You don't have any experience and you, and you think you're going to do it for $50,000. We build, and Deborah Robb, who does a lot of our work and, and builds houses and, she, and renovates houses, she can t say that's nowhere near the budget. So I guess our uh, ideal buyer for either commercial or industrial is, is somebody that's really willing to listen. Of course, it's it's easier for us if you come to us and I have plenty of money, I've got lots of experience, but we're, we're certainly open to somebody who's new, who wants to learn. Um, so I think our ideal buyer, I would say, is somebody who's really paying attention, listening, and, and wants to learn how to do it. Okay, great, thank you. And you mentioned Deborah. I see Deborah sitting here. Uh, Deborah, stand up. Uh, Deborah is one of the original port employees when we were, when we were founded back in, uh, I think 2009 or so, right? Yeah. So she's, one, if not the oldest employee of, of the port, uh, she's one of them for sure. And, and I don't mean it in the way that you guys just heard that. All right. Most tenured. How's that? All right. Um, last round robin question for each of you. Is there anything in your specific areas that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share? You know, the only thing I'd add is that, uh, that, you know, pick up the phone and call and reach out. I think the, the most underappreciated value of the port is, um, are the people on the other end of the phone, is our staff. Um, they're working every day um, on answering questions with small developers, minority developers who haven't done it before. Um, we started working with a minority developer who I'm not going to call out, it might be in the room. Um, a few years ago, and, uh, and he was incredible, and he said, look, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to get financing. I didn't know that I wasn't going to be able to go to a bank and finance the entire project. Um, and that level of vulnerability is the kind of, um, uh, the kind of trust building relationship that allowed us to step in and say, okay, well, we're here to help. Let's connect you with Cincinnati Development Fund, and let's show you and understand how the tax abatement process works at the city. Um, because ultimately, the, the staff every day um, that are working in our neighborhood and industrial teams, you know, they want to see what's best for neighborhoods and, and our communities. Um, and their patience and um, expertise is a true um, resource that, that can be leveraged. Thank you. Melissa? Well, I'll just make kind of a, a note of distinction. Um, obviously, I think the industrial work is 
a little bit different. It's a different size or scale of complexity, but you know the, the port in those instances really does work as what I would term as the horizontal developer. We acquire the property, we tear it down, we get it readied you know, to be just you know, a, a piece of land that should attract market investment. Um, but inside of that, we have our own partnerships, and they typically show up in contracting partnerships, um, but we do pre-qualify contractors. We have a, a tiered level. We try to create an easy point of entry and access to gaining to doing work with the port, either if you're a demolition contractor or environmental remediation or do site readiness or you know geotechnical engineering. And so if there's interest in engaging in you know the industrial strategy in that way, we always welcome that and um, try and also grow our own companies here locally and give them access to, to what does make sense, that, you know, that there is a way to take a part of a project or a whole project and um, you know, grow businesses inside of the strategy as well. So that's just an, you know, a quick distinction that I wanted to offer so you know, that, that that's also um, you know, a, a piece of growing wealth and, and growing our own companies here in the city. And Bill. And and I'll probably just, very similar, um, we do a lot of work, we hire a lot of small contractors, we, we build the, we mentioned all those properties in the land bank back in 2012, 2013, the port really started its own renovations and construction to, to, to get these properties moving, and so we use a lot of contractors. Philip mentioned the, the um, 194 homes that we purchased from an out-of-town investor, we're in the process of renovating those, selling those for home ownership. So if you want to get into the business, you're not ready to maybe risk all your own capital and, and buying and developing property, but you want to get into it and you are you have the skills, um, you can reach out if you want to be a contractor and it could be a painter or um, a simple renovation. We do, uh, we hire a lot of those contractors ourselves. So that's another, another way to build wealth. All right, outstanding. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. So thank you all uh, for attending this panel discussion. Uh, one housekeeping thing I want to remind everyone that we do have a resource table just outside of this room at, at the very front. Please stop by if you have any questions. I know there was one question that was brought to me that um, I didn't get a chance to uh, read because it, it was going to take us a little bit of time to, to answer that. So if, you, if we didn't address something that you still have questions about, please stop by our resource table. We'll be here all day. Give it up for the Port Authority. In, a, in addition to being at their resource table throughout the day, um, for the next 15 minutes, uh, they will all be at the speaker's area, which is located directly across from the registration area. They're going to follow Sonny to that table now, to that area now. So that question or questions that you didn't want to ask or didn't get a chance to ask, you can ask them in a one-on-one -on -one um, opportunity you can exchange business cards all of that so we are running a little bit behind our next session in this room will be real estate development 101 that will start in five minutes attracting private capital preparing to approach lenders and investors that will be in ballroom C so you'll go down the hall around the corner to the registration table and you'll be able to get into both ballroom C and ballroom D there in ballroom D we'll have underwriting your project best practices for avoiding pitfalls. Thank you all so much.